um, I'd love you all to pause and think with me for 20 seconds. To think about a place you care for, a place you love. Whether that's by your childhood home, outside your favorite coffee shop, or by the sea. I'm thinking about Lake Rotomar in New Zealand. It was here that every year I was fortunate my parents could drive me. I was on these shores, I feel like I grew up, trying things, taking the time to learn and explore. And it's also where I failed many, many times. And it's here that I hope to take my grandkids, where I hope to towel them off after similarly huge falls and bake them mum's homemade bread. So all of us here, regardless of our beliefs, preferences, values, backgrounds, we all want our loved ones to experience some of the beauty we just pictured. We want fewer chores, progress to continue, more time to spend with our friends, to make memories, to play sports, maybe to create art. And we want this, this sharing of ideas, of beauty, of progress, to continue for millennia. An economic history professor here at Duke likens humanity's current progress to a train, a train we're all on together on specific tracks. In the last 200 years, our health and livelihoods have dramatically improved. Poverty rates have plummeted from 90% to 10%. Global population has quadrupled. We've seen innovations like plastics revolutionize health and medicine, health and our livelihoods. Representation of gender and race is increasing on the first class. Air quality is improving as we power the train with solar panels. Entertainment systems are more engaging. And New Zealanders still beat Australians in most major sporting events. <laughs> and so in every way, Life seems to be getting better. But at the same time, ever since these tracks started, the analogy goes, we're heading off a cliff. And I want to be, I'm not here to fearmonger. I want to be precise and realistic for you. More realistically, we're headed towards damage, damaged, rickety rails, which can't support the potential 10 billion people on our train nor the continued beauty or progress we want. And I've been blessed for the last five years to meet hundreds of scientists and CEOs trying to reverse climate change, redesigning our material world from the way we create concrete to the fabrics we wear. I believe in the power of human ingenuity. I believe we could hold climate change at two degrees. At the same time, though, we each all see these increasingly complex social, societal, and environmental externalities cropping up. We're currently breaching a variety of planetary boundaries. We don't know what's happening from all the excess chemicals flooding our world. We do know that nitrates and ocean acidification are creating massive ocean dead zones. And we all know the importance of biodiversity, which we study in kindergarten, every animal playing their role has plummeted by 68% in the last five decades. Worst of all, this has been accelerating. And so fundamentally, it looks like the tracks we're on, the economic system that brought us to this point, is no longer fit for the scale our train, humanity, has reached. But while these problems are scary, I'm not here to scare you. We need not be scared. I'm here to share that there's a potential pathway. I'm here to share the seeds of hope, the seeds we could rebuild the tracks upon. So mankind's progress started on a separation from nature. <laughs> but nature is a gigantic dynamic system that's lasted for a lot longer than we've been here. <laughs> His powers of sustainability frankly make any smaller system jealous. Every single living system from rainforests to oceans, to the ways the cells and organs in our body interact, follow a series of common tendencies, patterns, principles, that let them sustain and thrive, and grow and flourish over time. What if we could redesign our economy 
the way our businesses and ourselves interact to mimic what lasts here. So regenerative economics is an emerging term to describe that. In 2015, Kaplan Institute released a white paper and a series of eight initial principles drawing from sciences. And while the idea of applying nature's patterns to our economic system is new, the idea is not. And it draws upon increasing agreement that we see from ecology, biology, chemistry, physics, to complex system science and chaos theory. And it also draws upon ancient wisdom, what we see in sociology. So to start understanding what a regenerative system could look like, take a lion in nature's ever most successful economy. In nature, just like we have in our world, there are hierarchies. The lion sits at the top, sleeping, relaxing, spending most of his day enjoying, and then kills. And in doing so, he keeps a balance between smaller and larger animals. He plays a healthy role in the hierarchy. He honors his place in community and right relationship. And he keeps this balance. But when a king of the jungle, be he Simba, the fishing industry, or JP Morgan, expands its purview or extracts without pause, you obviously have an unhealthy system, a system that cannot possibly last. So to redesign ours, our hierarchies to look like nature, we need economists and policymakers to start thinking about what incentives still encourage growth, still have the same advancement, but discourage it when it becomes growth for growth's sake, or when it's no longer serving its place in the community. And regenerative economics is about more than just healthy hierarchies. It's about understanding that in this web of life, damage to other locales flows back to harm our own. We can't export our problems, or we see in current society that it flows back, whether that's in ocean pollution or the supply chain crises we face. Regenerative economics is also about redesigning the way we view incentives and success, wealth, so that we're harmonizing multiple variables like we see in nature, the balance, rather than pursuing one, rather than allowing one, the growth of some pursuit, potentially like the analogy before, to turn into a cancer that undermines the whole. And finally, it's about changing the fact, not finally, not quite, <laughs> but it's also about changing the fact that humanity is the only system we see where you have linear inputs, use, products, and waste, sometimes toxic, rather than reintegrating, regenerating it back into our system. All in all, regenerative economics asks us to identify the patterns we see working in nature and applying them to our incentives, society, the way we structure businesses and government so that we might also. These are eight principles that the Capital Institute identified, but they're just the beginning. These are not final. And so it's important to understand that regenerative economics is not about stopping capitalism. It's not what I'm here to say. I'll never forget at Duke, sitting down with political science professor and libertarian politician Michael Munger, who paused and said to the class, Capitalism is not some amorphous system that causes these problems. Capitalism, a capitalistic society, describes a society where you have markets, where participants can freely and openly trade goods and services, usually with viable alternatives. It allows things to flourish in a non-corrupt, non-authoritarian way. We're talking about the economics, the incentives, what we build underneath that system. So it's also really important to understand this is not liberal, conservative. This is not even a bipartisan proposal. While stricter environmental controls might sound more liberal, that's only if it's implemented in a way that increases government power. If anything, conservative ranchers, some of whom I've been fortunate to meet because one family took me in during COVID, they know best how to care for ecosystems over time. The importance of abiding by hunting limits and adapting their practices so they can create a flourishing future. 
for generations. Conservers will also be drawn to the ground up entrepreneurial economy that a regenerative system or the early imaginings of one would necessitate that we see in nature. And furthermore, across both sides of the aisle, maybe including academics in this room, people are currently examining how can we reduce the issues from concentrations of power. So fundamentally, it's not following an ideology because nature doesn't have an ideology. These patterns evolved because they are what works to sustain a large, complex system, society, over time, indefinitely. It's about us implementing them as the basis from which we can redesign our world. And so, well, I'm aware that this is, this is early. We, we don't know what this looks like. I'm not coming up here and asking you to change your careers, to change your lives, or go and ad advocate for this right now because it's just starting. This could take decades. The current incentives and systems we rely on, we're embedded in, certainly did. <laughs> so fundamentally, this is a transition that will take time. But fortunately, it's starting to pick up pace. We see regenerative agriculture becoming a more common way to use land, simply because it's better better for that system to thrive and sustain at the scale we've reached. We see Duke's very own Dirk Philipson launch the Wellbeing Economy Alliance to start examining what are those metrics which allow an economy to flourish. He said, whatever they are, they will need to learn from nature, and they'll need to have some pattern of regeneration in them. And Walmart, a massive company, in 2020 announced that it was going to examine how it could take on this mammoth task of changing both its supply chain and approaches, but also its culture. Like, how can we build this paradigm? And finally, dozens and dozens of think tanks and blockchain startups are starting to imagine what could those businesses look like? What do regenerative companies look like? So, we all want prosperity and progress to continue. This transition, if it happens, will be difficult. Any transition is. But we have a model to copy. We have hope. We have nature to copy. So a transition with human ingenuity, perhaps with your focus over the coming years, could happen. If it does, it will need writers and artists to help communicate and better share what this could look like. It will need innovators, academics, a variety of researchers to examine how their individual industries or fields could adapt the living systems principles we see. And we need economists, policy makers, to adapt and bring this into their work, to design the incentives, learning from nature, which best work with humans. And we need sociologists. And we need, certainly need conservatives and liberals to adapt this and suggest the implementation that works. We need innovators to redesign new business models and certainly new investment vehicles. But fundamentally, my call today is not asking you to change your career. If you're interested in digging in more, if you'd like to make this a part of your work, I'd love you to. I'd recommend checking out Capital Institute's website, starting to look into these fields of science. But just like me today, mostly I'd love you to start this ball, to join me and share this idea to get it rolling. Because the sooner we embrace an economy which mimics nature, an economy which learns from the system we know that lasts, the sooner we unlock an economy that has clear environmental boundaries, it decentralizes power and allows entrepreneurialism to thrive, the sooner we have a world where our grandkids will promise the same progress the same improvements that we were, and their grandkids and their grandkids. Let's explore the tracks on which humanity could flourish for millennia. Thank you.